Over the past few weeks, you have been studying congregational spiritual formation from a variety of point of views. The first week we looked at what was your story and what is the current story happening in your ministry context. You've looked at the biblical view of congregational formation, historical perspective, and then in this unit we've been discussing the theological view of congregational spiritual formation, specifically looking at soteriology. And Wesley has been our guide. A couple of weeks ago, Dr. Drury shared a video in which he discussed the influencers, the influencers of Wesley. Who were the people, the thoughts going on in his day or prior to his day that he was reading that impacted him and his point of view? And you probably have been able to identify some of them now that you understand who they are and what to look for as you've been reading some of Wesley's sermons and reading a little bit more about Wesley. And then Dr. Eby presented a video on soteriology, introducing us to the concept in broad terms, but with a specific look at what was Wesley's soteriology, and prompting you to think in terms of how has your own experience reflected that of Wesley's, and beginning to think in terms of what is your so soteriology. And of course, it's not gonna be long, and you're going to be asked to put together a complete soteriology. What is your view? This week, we're adding another step in the process, and we're looking at specifically Wesley's catechesis. Now, I need to pause just a moment and offer a little bit of clarification on terms before we move forward, because it could be a little confusing. Catechesis, is the study for this week. A catechesis is a method of instruction. It's the form of instruction. It's the programs and practices that we put together in order to move people forward in their faith formation. It includes a variety of things, and we're going to look at Wesley's catechesis. Catechesis differs from catechism, which is probably a term you've heard and are familiar with. Catechism is the actual curriculum that includes the doctrine that we use to teach in, in catechesis. So catechism, think of it as the curriculum. There are a variety of catechisms out there. You've probably been exposed to some, have read some. Perhaps even in this course you've read a few, such as Luther's, Calvin's, Wesley's catechism, the Westminster catechism. Most denominations have one. I'm sure that yours does as well. Catechism, a curriculum that is informing of the doctrine. And then the third term are catechumens. What is a catechumen? A catechumen is the person who is going through the catechesis, the planned instruction, using a catechism as the curriculum guide. So catechesis, that's the structure, the program of instruction. Catechism is the curriculum, teaching the doctrine that we use in a catechesis and a catechumen, the person going through it. We're going to spend the next couple of minutes talking about Wesley's catechesis. What was it? What were the programs and practices that Wesley put in place in a systematic order so that his people would develop what he called a goal of holiness of heart and life? Holiness of heart and life. Catechesis looks at developing cognitively for the people, behaviorally, and affectively, the holistic whole domain of the individual. What was Wesley's catechesis? Catechesis had emerged in the early church around the second century. Why? Because you had a lot of new believers coming to the Christian faith who didn't understand the programs and practices. It wasn't a common language. It wasn't commonly understood. What was this thing called the Christian faith? It was just burgeoning on the scene, right? And so they put together a series of practices. Remember, this was an oral tradition, so they didn't have the availability of books to hand them. They didn't have a written catechism to hand them, if you will. And so they put together a series of practices to lead these new believers, these new converts, deeper into the faith and prepare them for believer's baptism, which was the final initiation into church membership. It was not unusual for catechesis to take three years from conversion to baptism, three years of going through a series of practices as they were formed into the faith. 
congregational spiritual formation was occurring. It waned a little bit, catechesis, the use of them waned a little bit about the fifth century and after, and then was revised again during the Reformation. And so we have Luther writing a catechism and developing a catechesis. That influence can be seen, obviously, in Wesley, as Dr. Drury pointed out earlier. And so Wesley developed a catechesis as part of this renewed interest in developing a program and practice, a specific strategy for developing people further in their faith, further in their faith. Why was that so critical to Wesley and his whole strategy, what he was about? Well, we have to remember that Wesley was not about forming a new denomination. He was not about being a theologian and writing a theology. Wesley's primary desire was to experience and for his people to experience a renewal of their faith. Who were his people? The Anglicans. He was a minister in the Church of England, the Anglican Church, and he saw that the church had lost, as you will, its first love. And he wanted the congregation, the Anglican congregation, to experience renewal. And so he put together and put in place some of these items. It's also really important to understand that Wesley's catechesis developed over time. It wasn't as if he just kind of went off some, one day and sat down and said, let me think of all of the things that need to go together in an ecology of faith. Does that sound familiar? You all developed an ecology of faith in week one. He didn't say, let me develop a, an ecology of faith and in which we'll move people from a seeker all the way to a fully devoted follower of Christ. No, these were things that he gradually added one after the other, adjusted one after the other to see how they would fit. It's easy for us 300 some years later to look back on Wesley's catechesis and say, oh my goodness, he was an absolutely brilliant strategist. But the truth of the matter is, he probably is a brilliant strategist, was a brilliant strategist. But the truth of the matter is, his process of catechesis his process of developing a congregational spiritual formation that will take, would take his people, the Methodists, the people who were desiring this renewal, to take them deeper in their faith, deeper devoted followers of Christ, so that they would experience holiness of heart and life. And that should give you um, great relief. Because it's hard for us to sit down and think just off the blue, what is the strategic response that we should have overall? And know immediately, we're going to name it, it's going to work, and all will be good. Because how often have we started things and they failed? We tried things and they didn't accomplish the goals we, we thought they would. Wesley had that exact same experience. So as you too are do, using trial and error to figure out how do I develop an ecology of faith? How do I develop a catechesis? so that our people will experience holiness of heart and life as we form the congregation, as the Holy Spirit does a marvelous work in the lives and hearts and minds of our people. Remember that Wesley had a few starts and stops and took a while to develop this. All right, let's look at Wesley's catechesis. A great way to visualize it is at a as a pyramid, an inverted pyramid. At the top of Wesley's pyramid would absolutely be the Church of England. When people often talk about Wesley's discipleship approach or catechesis, they often forget to include the Church of England or the Anglican Church. They often forget to include that as a key element, a key ingredient in his overall catechesis. Why do we forget to include it? because he didn't invent it. And all of these other things he developed for, uniquely for the people called Methodists. However, Wesley always believed that the, in the Church of England and the ministries, the unique ministries that the Church of England provided. In each phase, and there will be four of them, each phase in this pyramid that is Wesley's catechesis, every phase has a unique contribution to congregational spiritual formation. So what is the unique contribution of the spirit to spiritual formation in the Anglican Church, in the Church of England experience? It was liturgy and sacrament. Wesley assumed that all of the people who called themselves Methodists, remember it was not a denomination, it was a movement within the Anglican Church at this time. 
all of the people who called themselves Methodists, who were looking for renewal, participated in the Church of England, the top part of the pyramid. And so every Sunday they would gather at the Church of England in their local Anglican church and experience liturgy, which connected them to the past and sacrament, communion and baptism, a unique means of grace. Wesley found that both liturgy and sacrament were vital elements to the faith formation of the people and to the congregation as a whole. Why? Liturgy, as I said, connects us to our past. And Wesley saw that the tr understanding the tradition, understanding what history says about something, understanding the historical view was highly influential in our faith formation. As we say the liturgy today, and as they said the liturgy when they gathered in their churches in his day, they were reminded of the tradition, of the history. They were connected to their past. Liturgy is valuable. And the sacrament. What was it about the sacrament that was so critical to Wesley's faith formation, understanding? Wesley saw the Eucharist and baptism as what he called unique means of grace. A unique means of grace, meaning that God's grace was experienced during the sacrament in a way that it was not experienced in any other way through the other ordinary means of grace or instituted means of grace, which we'll discuss in a little bit. Unique means of grace. It was so profound the impact of engaging in Eucharist for Wesley that he said, why would I not seek to do it as many times as I could? Of course, in the Anglican service, communion was always a part of every service, but Wesley personally sought out to experience communion. Some reports say up to five times a week. He said, if it is a unique means to experience God's grace, I need all of God's grace, as much of it as I can possibly receive. The Church of England, the first phase in Wesley's understanding of catechesis, of how people are formed. Why? Liturgy and sacrament happened there. But there was also something happening during the Anglican services that Wesley realized was the cause of needing reform or needing people to have an experience so they could go deeper. The problem was a lack of understanding, a lack of understanding. Within the Anglican services, first of all, there was a huge division of classes. At this time in England, class struggle was significant and the stratification of classes was clear. And within the Anglican church, when they gathered, the classes were separated. And the poorest of poor often didn't even feel like they had access to the Anglican church. If they had access, physical access to the service, they didn't have access in terms of understanding. Why? Because the services were high church. Said in a language, even if it was English, high English, that the common man didn't understand, the common woman couldn't grasp, let alone children and teens, a language that was not clear to them. And Wesley in his sermon says to the people and in his teachings to his ministers, he says to them, speak in a language that they will understand, use their own words so that they can understand what you're saying. He believed in significantly in contextualization. And so he realized as they attend the Anglican services, they are experiencing liturgy. There's value in liturgy. They are experiencing the sacraments. There is value in sacraments, but there's something missing. What is that something? Understanding. Understanding of the word. And so Wesley formed societies, the next phase in our pyramid. Societies. Societies was their large group gathering. Sometimes people have the false impression that societies were the equivalent to the church service or the, what you would call your Sunday morning worship or celebration. That's not the case for Wesley. Remember, he never gave up on the Church of England. And so he had the assumption that his people were participating in the Church of England or at least was compelled to encourage them to participate in the Church of England for liturgy and sacrament. 
And so society meanings were not seen by him as a replacement of that. They were in addition to it. A large group gathering that never occurred, they never met at the same time as the Anglican services. So they did not meet Sunday mornings, Sunday afternoons or Sunday evenings, but not Sunday morning during Anglican worship. Societies. Wesley developed over time some chapels where the people would gather, 50 plus, would gather to hear the word spoken in a language they understood so they would have understanding of the gospel and sung, the theology sung, to a tune that they could sing. Of course, they were Charles's hymns. Now, there's another misconception that I want to break today, and that is the suggestion that Charles's hymns were common bar tunes. I don't know where this comes from. I'm confident it doesn't come in England because in England they don't call it a bar where you go to uh, socialize and drink. That's not what they call a bar, but it's what we call a bar. And so we have this thought that, oh, you know, in the pubs and the taverns there were songs that would be sung and Charles put Christian language to them. That's not what happened. That's not a bar tune. A bar tune is a reference to the structure of the song. The way that the notes moved was simplistic enough that common people could sing them. People who didn't have any musical knowledge or ability. They were a common bar tune, an easily sung tune. Theological doctrine put with an easily sung tune. And we're told that, incredibly, remember John believed strongly in contextualization, the word compelled and communicated in a language they understood, their own language, right? Charles understood this as well, and we're told that he would develop these songs, such as, as can, um, and can it be, and it, there would be different tunes depending on the area in England that they were singing them. They were simple enough melodic structure that they could be sung in a bit of a different tune or melody that would be more recognizable or more, or more easily sung by the local people in whatever context he was. So moving from Bristol to in London, perhaps, um, and can it be, would have been sung in a bit of a different tune. I think that's very interesting. The understanding that you need to contextualize so they can hear it in a language they understand and that they can actually sing along with it. Oh boy, that has great implications for um, our approach to singing in church, doesn't it? Well, we're not going to go there today. Societies, large gathering for the purpose of understanding of the gospel and theology, hearing the word spoken in a word they understood, in a language they understood, and singing the theology to tunes that they could engage. And these became incredibly popular gathering. People flocked to the societies. The only requirement for attendance at the beginning, the only requirement at the beginning to attend, was you desired to flee the wrath of God, as they would say. You desired to flee the wrath of God. You, in other words, you were seeking something other than what you knew. And so that was the only compelling reason peop that people were requested to, in order to gather. Why are we gathering? For understanding. What were people lo looking for? To seek the wrath of God. Societies, the next phase in Wesley's pyramid of catechesis. The third phase were classes. Classes. Can you see how the pyramid is getting smaller? The Church of England, right? The Church of England, broad. It's the national church of the country. Societies, large gatherings of people who would flock to flee the wrath of God, to hear this word, to sing these beautiful songs that they could sing along with. And then classes. That was Wesley's small group structure, made of about 10 to 12 people who would gather weekly. And the structure for this was very simple. So the preached word and the sung song, theological song, happened in the societies, usually Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening. During the course of the week, they would meet in their classes and they would open with prayer. And then there would be one question that they would explore every week. There was not a set curriculum. It wasn't a Bible study that they were doing. There was one primary question that they would explore and it was, how has your soul prospered this week? How has your soul prospered? 
In the societies, the people, the, all the classes gathered, sitting side by side and worshiping together, which contrasted greatly from the Anglican worship. In classes, they gathered by where they lived. They gathered in their, by neighborhood. You see, Wesley wanted the people in the classes understanding that the purpose was high accountability and to teach and um, it demonstrate the behaviors that went along with this understanding of the gospel. This was the holiness of life. What does it look like to live it out? High accountability of the behaviors that went along with the understanding of the gospel needed to be with people who you were going to run into all week. And so he grouped the classes. It was mixed gender, mixed marital status, somewhat perhaps mixed class, although they probably lived within uh, areas of similar socioeconomic status. Uh, but mixed marital status, gender, and age would gather based on their community once a week. The leader would open with a prayer, sometimes a hymn, a simple song, and then he would share first how it has gone with his soul this week. Focusing on questions such as what sins have you committed? What temptations have you faced? How have you overcome the temptation? Is there any word, thought, or deed that you think may have been a sin that you experienced this week? Those kind of difficult accountability questions occur there. This is also where people began to get a glimpse of how have you overcome? I overcame by, by engaging in the means of grace. grace. What were the means of grace? Acts of piety, and acts of mercy. Acts of piety, it's a weird term that we don't use very much anymore. Acts of piety, though, were the spiritual disciplines, the prayer, the gathering together, the reading the God's word. How are you doing experiencing the means of grace, the acts of piety, and how are you doing engaging in acts of mercy, compassionate ministries, caring for the poor and the lost, feeding the hungry, taking care of the widows and orphans, that's the acts of mercy. And Wesley's movement, the Methodist movement, was highly concerned in acts of mercy. His chapel in London offered food and offered medical help, offered education, financial counseling, incredible, the full orb ministry experience provided by Wesley's chapels because he understood the need to, to give acts of mercy, and the huge need that people have of requiring mercy. Why? Because he understood long before Maslow's hierarchy of need, understood long before that, that you cannot tell someone that God loves them on an empty stomach. And so they need their bellies filled. They need to have trust and security in their surroundings before they can really comprehend, understand that God loves them. The societies, understanding, the classes focused on behavior. How has your soul prospered this week? How have you experienced the, and engaged in the acts of piety and the acts of mercy? And then the final phase in Wesley's pyramid are the bands. The bands. This was even a smaller group. As I said, as the pyramid goes down, the numbers decrease. A smaller group. The groups themselves and the classes, it was 10 to 12 people. And the bands, it was more like four, five, or six people. Where societies, everybody mixed together, standing shoulder to shoulder, worshiping and hearing the word. Classes, you were hanging out once a week with people who live in your neighborhood, who you're going to pass on the street and go to the market next to. In the bands, bands were homogenous groups, meaning they were purposely and intentionally the same. Same gender, same socioeconomic status, same marital status. And they had the same desire. For the societies and classes, it was the desire to flee the wrath of God. For the bands, it was the desire to go deeper. These were the committed Christians. This was Wesley's leadership training, where it occurred. And when you think of in terms of cognitive, behavioral, and affective, this was where affective really kicked into gear. Although affective would have gone along with the classes as well. Affective, leadership training, going deeper. 
It was the same structure as the classes, but much higher account accountability and complete and total trust. This is a safe place where I can share what I'm really struggling with. And these individuals who are similar life station, life stage as I am, can help hold me accountable and help spur me on deeper in my faith, the bands. One note <clears throat> to recognize, the pyramid, like I said, the Church of England was the broad, the biggest gathering. Societies, 50 plus individuals, next size. Classes, 10 to 12, bands, four to six. You can see in the pyramid how fewer and fewer people engaged in each level at the same time. One thing that happened, though, was that the societies became so popular that Wesley had to think of a way so that, to control who was showing up because people were showing up just for the show. They were interested in what's happening. And so they were just like, did you hear what those Wesley brothers are up to? And in fact, in Bristol, if you go to his chapel in Bristol, there is a back stairs for the pulpit and the pulpit is elevated above the crowd. Part of that was, and there's, and if you go upstairs, you can like look down and see who's coming. Part of that was, is because the ministers literally feared for their lives. They were in danger of preaching this. This was considered radical belief. And you understand at the same time in Bristol, what's happening is the slave trade is occurring. And Wesley is preaching against that. He's preaching for mercy. And he's t saying in our societies, we stand shoulder to shoulder because they're, we are breaking down the walls of class structure. That was not popular. That was not welcomed. And so the ministers did need to fear for their lives in those situations. And so how do we make sure that the people showing up the societies are people who truly are fearing the wrath of God? And so one thing Wesley added what in the process of developing his catechesis was a ticket system. I know, strange, right? You needed to get a ticket in order to go get into the societies. You had to present a ticket at the door. And it wasn't a ticket that you bought. It was a ticket that you, with cash, it was a ticket that you bought with your time at the class meeting. You attended the class meeting, you would get a ticket so that you could then attend the society meeting. Isn't that crazy to even think about that his society meetings, his large group gatherings for the understanding of the word and the corporate singing, the corporate singing, the common man able to sing these songs because they're in a tune that they could sing. Common man singing, common woman singing. It was so popular. The people flocked to it in order to control the crowds you were required to attend small group during the week to get a ticket to come on Sunday. That's mind blowing for me and it's incredible to think about how does that relate to how, what happens in your context on a typical weekend. Most of the time in our churches, we're trying so hard to get people involved in small groups. We recognize the need for discipleship, the unique discipleship that only happens in small groups. And in a couple of weeks, we're going to research that and explore that together. But there is something, as you could see in Wesley's Pyramid, there is something unique that happens in our faith formation, in our congregational faith formation and personal something unique that happens in every phase of Wesley's pyramid, liturgy and sacrament, understanding of the word and theology through spoken word and sung song, accountability and understanding of the expectation of behavior of living a life of holiness, and high accountability, going deeper, and leadership training in the bands. My question for you this week, as you explore what Wesley's catechesis looks like and reflect on it, think in terms of what is your catechesis. As I said in week one, you were asked to d write out what is your ecology of faith based on those five things, preaching, fellowship, service, worship, and teaching. What are all of the things you do in each of those categories that contribute to the faith formation of your people? Maybe you recall that. This week, I want you to think in terms of Wesley's pyramid, his catechesis. The four key phases in Wesley's catechesis and the unique outcome.
outcomes of each, the unique outcome of each. Where do those occur in your context? How are you forming your people through liturgy and sacrament? How are you forming your people? What kind of catechesis programs and practices do you use to help them gain an understanding of the word and of theology? Where are you giving your people an opportunity to learn the behaviors and to hold one another accountable for living a life like Christ, a holiness of heart and life? And where are you taking your strong believers deeper in the faith? Where do you provide leadership training and high, high level of accountability? Where is it happening in your, in your ministry context? That's what I want you to go to the discussion forum and talk about. Perhaps you'll develop a pyramid. Perhaps yours will look something different. Chart out what is it you do? What is your catechesis? And what is the unique outcome of each phase of your catechesis? And then offer a summative paragraph that explains to me how does it compare to Wesley's. Did you identify some areas that are missing? Did you identify some areas that probably need adjustment so they achieve their outcome more effectively? Or are there areas that you say, we are nailing it here, and this is why. I look forward to your response in the discussion forum.